Amen. Hallelujah. Who? I told Pam, I can't believe I get to see this live. Wow. You know, there was a, there was a um, uh, show on uh, 3ABN, not 3ABN, uh, Adventist uh, Hope TV. Uh, this is my story. This is my song. And it was primarily filmed in Brazil. I can tell you, Brazilian people are so gifted. And we're so glad that we got to have a taste of that this morning here at the Middletown Seventh-day Adventist Church. So it's great. And it's a special Sabbath. Anything from uh, ministry moments and what's going on in, in, in the opportunities that we have in our community to what's going on here this morning is great. I feel already blessed. Uh, and uh, this morning, uh, yeah, this is a time of preaching, so I'm not the one preaching because I got an opportunity to uh, let someone uh, preach the Word of God to us, and I'll be glad to just sit there and be preached at. He is uh, Elder Joel Sutherland. He is the Ministerial Director of the Georgia Cumberland Conference. In other words, he's my, uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> Kentucky, Tennessee, I'm still in, yeah, uh, um, and, 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 and I'm, uh, yeah, he is, he is my pastor, in other words, um, he and Chelsea and Chelsea's uh, uh, sister are here with us this morning, he will share the word of God with us, Joel? graduated from Southern, right? And uh, he also went to the seminary, graduated from a seminary, pastored in two districts in Kentucky, Tennessee Conference. <laughs> and then he also pastored in uh, Pennsylvania Conference before he came back and uh, took up the leadership position to be the ministerial director. So Joel, it's our privilege to have you share the Word of God with us this morning. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm happy to be here. It's a beautiful, beautiful church facility and a beautiful drive up here this morning. The fall colors are gorgeous. The weather is perfect. I, could, I just wish it was fall year round. That's, that's what I'm hoping heaven will be like because it will be this, this time of year. Oops, I advanced that too fast. Um, so yes, I am currently serving as ministerial director. One of my favorite parts of this role is getting to visit the different churches in the conference and getting to know the members and being blessed. That special music this morning was amazing. That, that fed my soul. I, I know people are ministered to in different ways, but music is what ministers to me. And so thank you for blessing me this morning. Um, such, such a blessing. As you mentioned, my wife, Chelsea, she, it didn't look like she was going to be able to join me today, um, but she was able to rearrange her schedule. So she's here with us. And uh, also her sister, Amanda, she is a enrollment counselor for Southwestern Adventist University and was here this week um, in the Nashville area doing some recruiting. And uh, after she finished work, she ended up spending the weekend with us. So glad to have her here as well. I really like getting gifts. Now, this isn't some kind of hint, it's just stating a fact. And I imagine that most of you can relate to that. Everyone likes getting gifts. Now, we like getting gifts for different reasons, however. Now, my wife Chelsea, her love language is receiving gifts and giving gifts. And so, it doesn't really matter what the gift is. What matters to her is the thought of the person behind the gift. So I could give her a card or a brand new car. It doesn't really matter much, maybe. <laughs> the, the reality is she's just excited that I love her and gave her something to show that. Now for me, gifts are not my love language. I don't really care about the thought behind the gift. I care about the gift itself. <laughs> now I come from a large family and uh, I have five brothers and one sister. So you can imagine during holiday times, oh, I forgot to, this is gonna confuse me. I'm advancing two different slides, one on my iPad and one on here. So hopefully I remember to keep that straight. Um, so you can imagine as holiday times come, uh, if we were each to give everybody in our family a gift, it would get rather expensive. So what my family does, and we just did this a couple weeks ago, is we draw names and whoever gets the name, then they're the ones that get the gift for that person. Now, to make it easier, we keep a wish list that we try to keep updated, and that way, if I get one of my brothers for, um, to, to give them a gift, I will look at their wish list and figure out what they're looking for and, and try to choose something 
along those lines. Well, my little siblings, I still have several uh, teenage siblings, <laughs> they complain sometimes because a lot of the gifts on my wish list are rather pricey. And I can imagine, as you get older, you start wanting more expensive things. I mean, if it was something cheap, I'd go buy it myself, right? <laughs> if it's a gift, it needs to be something that I don't want to spend my money on. Now, in my defense, I do have some cheap gifts on there. But the majority is rather expensive. Well, the Apostle Paul talks about gifts that Jesus gives us in Ephesians chapter 4. And this comes directly after a passage at the end of Ephesians chapter 3 where Paul is talking about how God can do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. And the, the wonderful thing is, is that God isn't like my siblings. He doesn't complain that our requests cost too much. Instead, we can't even imagine the greatness of the gifts that God longs to bestow on us. But before we discover what these gifts are and open to Ephesians chapter 4, let's ask the Holy Spirit to be with us once again. Father in heaven, Lord, we come before you this morning in your house. Lord, we know that you've promised that where two or three are gathered together in your name, there you are in their midst. And so, Lord, we know you're here. Lord, my request this morning is that we would be aware of your presence, that we would be able to feel you, that you would speak to us. Be with me as I speak. Help the words that come out of my mouth not to be my words, but to be your words. And be, be the Holy Spirit translator this morning. By the time my words get to the ears of your hearers, change the message if need be. Let it be a personalized message from your throne to your people gathered here this morning. Lord, thank you for the Bible. As we open its pages, speak to us. But most of all, we would see Jesus. And in his name we pray, amen. Open your Bibles with me to Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to be looking at uh, really just one sentence. Ephesians chapter 4, 11 through 16. Paul ends up having some long sentences as he writes in his letters. And we're going to be looking at verses 11 through 16. As you're turning there, uh, this, uh, Paul begins this chapter at the beginning of chapter 4 by challenging the church to live up to the calling that they've been given. Now, if you think about the calling that God has placed on the church, it's easy to get overwhelmed and discouraged. So before the Ephesians could get discouraged, Paul shares the secret of how they could live up to this calling. Jesus would give them gifts. And Paul uses a psalm to illustrate this point. And we see this here in verse 8. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 8. Therefore he says, then he when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now, the word there for captivity is, could be translated as well as prisoner of war. And so that's why the New Living Translation translates it this way. When he ascended to the heights, he led a crowd of captives and gave gifts to his people. What do you think Paul is talking about here as he's quoting the book of Psalms? When he ascended to the heights, he led a crowd of captives and gave gifts to his people. Can you think of any time in Jesus' life where this was a reality? Right, resurrection? Okay, when did he ascend to the heights? Let's start there. Acts 1, after his resurrection, remember he was seen by, by many people, and then he ascended to heaven while his disciples watched him, right? Okay, so that's simple. Now, who are, the le who are the crowd of captives that he took with him? If, yes, if you go back to the book of Matthew, Matthew tells us that there was a great earthquake when Jesus died, and graves were split open, bodies were thrown out of those graves, and then he says that on Sunday morning when Jesus was raised to life, those bodies came to life, they got up, and they walked into the holy city. 
It's kind of crazy. And I can imagine if you were people in Jerusalem seeing these people that you know were dead come back to life, it would make quite an impression. Well, we believe that these people ascended to heaven with Jesus when he ascended to the throne of grace. And they were the first fruits with Jesus. And they are in heaven to this day. So these are the people. Why would Paul call them captives? Well, if you think about it, when we die and we go into the grave, aren't we kind of like prisoners of war, being held there, waiting until the war is over and we can finally be taken home? Isn't that true? So Jesus came out of the grave, bringing these prisoners of war whom he had rescued, bringing them home. And then he says here at the end that he gave gifts to his people. What's the gift? Eternal life. What happened after Jesus had ascended to heaven? His disciples were there in the upper room. The Holy Spirit. The day of Pentecost. Jesus gave the Holy Spirit. Now through that gift of the Holy Spirit, he gave specific gifts. And that's what Paul's getting ready to talk about. Now, if you notice, so Paul's quoting here from Psalm chapter 68 and verse 18. But there's a difference. If you notice, if you go back to Psalm 68, and it's here on the screen, you can look at it if you don't trust me. But here's what Psalm 68 says. You have ascended on high. You have led captivity captive. You have what? Received gifts among men. Why would Paul change this psalm when he quotes it. Well, Psalm 68, if you look at the context and read through the entire thing, it's a beautiful retelling of the story of the deliverance of the children of Israel from Egypt. And verse 18, this verse here, is specifically talking about when the children of Israel brought gifts to Moses to build the tabernacle. And you remember the story. God told Moses, let them build me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Moses made the announcement and said, you know, whatever gold or silver, anything valuable that you have, bring it to me. Let's build the tabernacle. And they did. And then there was so much stuff that Moses made another announcement saying, stop bringing it because we have more than enough. You remember that story? Well, that's what the psalmist is talking about here. And so he's talking about God. You have ascended on high. You have led captivity captive again. That word can be translated as captives or prisoners of war. So these are the captives that he's leading out of Egypt, leading them to the promised land. And then God received gifts when the children of Israel came and brought gifts to build the tabernacle. But when Paul quotes this verse, he changes the wording. Instead of us bringing gifts to the temple, Christ gives gifts to us who have become his temple. Now, you should have been given a little handout that's a sermon worksheet. If you'd like to, if it helps you concentrate and follow along, you can follow along with that. There are a few blanks on there that you can fill in. This is the first one. Instead of us bringing gifts to the temple, Christ gives gifts to us who have become his temple. Now, this is a big theme with Paul, especially here in Ephesians. We have become the temple of God. We're no longer building his temple. We have become his temple. And so Christ gives gifts to us who have become his temple. And what are these gifts? Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. We finally get here. This is where we're focusing today. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Now that, the Greek words there at the end, pastor, teachers, that's referring to one role most likely. So pastor, teachers, you could say. So the gifts that Christ gives, oops, are the apostles, prophets, evangelists, and pastor, teachers. It was my brother's birthday. Well, one of my brothers. I, I mentioned I have five of them. The next, the next oldest to me. We were little. I don't remember why, or I don't even remember what year it was. I think he was turning uh, maybe eight, seven or eight. We were, I don't remember why we had to, but for some reason we had to go to the store that day. And uh, we, we walked to the store that was close to our house. 
And we walked in, and to the left, I vividly remember this, when you walked through the doors, to the left was the toy section. And of course, where did my brother and I go? As soon as we walked in, we turned left, went into the toy section, started looking, and my brother found this. Anybody know what this is? A spirograph. Now, you can make different shapes. How many of you played with spirographs when you were little? How many of you still play with spirographs? <laughs> uh, you, you put this, you can diff make different shapes and patterns. You put these little gears into, um, you put a pencil into the gears and put it into the little circles and you can make shapes. And, and uh, anyway, he decided he really wanted it. And he grabbed it off the shelf, walked to my parents and started begging. I don't remember what argument he started with, but eventually he got to the point where he was using the fact that it was his birthday that they should give him this spirograph. Well, that didn't even work. But finally, he pulled out his closing argument. He said, this is the only thing I'll ever want. <laughs> The only thing I'll ever want. Well, I'm not sure if that's what convinced them or not, but my parents ended up buying him the spirograph. But they never forgot those words. This is the only gift, or the only thing I'll ever want. And there were many birthdays afterward where my brother would come down the stairs, come to the breakfast table, and there next to his plate would be a little package wrapped up. He'd open it up to find his spirograph once again. The only thing he would ever want. Now, of course, my parents gave him other gifts as well. But the interesting thing is, is as much as he wanted that spirograph, he didn't end up using it all that much. He'd play with it for a few hours, maybe. Then it would sit in a drawer until the next year when my parents would pull it back out, wrap it up, and give it back to him once again. Gifts, particularly good gifts, are great, but if you don't use the gift, if it doesn't serve a purpose, the gift is actually wasted. So Paul tells us that Christ has given us incredible gifts. These apostles, prophets, evangelists, and pastor teachers. Now, I don't know how many of those individuals are here. I know one for sure is Pastor Marius. And Pastor, I'm going to talk about you a little bit today. But don't worry, it's good things. So he's one of these gifts. He's been given to this part of the body of Christ as his gift to you. But what are the gifts for? How do you use Pastor Marius, so to speak? Are these apostles, prophets, evangelists, and pastor teachers supposed to do the work of ministry? Is that why he's here? Now we have this word we often call pastors ministers, right? That's not an accurate term. Pastor Marius isn't called to be a minister. What is his job? We find out in the next verse. So these gifts are given, verse 12, for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now, Old King James adds a comma there for the equipping of the saints, comma, for the work of ministry. That comma should not be there. The, the grammar is very clear. It's these gifts are given for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. So that you, so that I can then edify or build up the rest of the body of Christ. So what's Pastor Marius' job? So, yeah, so Old King James says perfecting of the saints, equipping the saints, preparing the saints, working with the saints, right? So what does that make you and I? It makes us ministers. If his job is to equip us for the work of ministry, that makes us ministers. And Pastor Marius, maybe a better term for him would be the equipper of ministers, the gifts equip us to minister and build up our brothers and sisters. Now, there's an old saying, they taught us this in school, that 20% of the members do 80% of the work. How many of you have heard that? 
Now, I know that's not true here, but in other churches, that's often the case. But what if that changed? What if we had total member involvement? And I've been excited this morning because I've heard a little bit about some of the initiatives that you guys have and some of the things you're doing in your community, and it's exciting. What if members started serving and building up other members? What if church leadership was freed up to begin equipping us to minister? What would the church look like? Honestly, I think this is a future that I'm excited about. A century or more ago, probably late 1800s, there was a mill owner. And he found his superintendent, one of his foremen, down in this wheel pit making some minor repairs and adjustments. And around the outside of that wheel pit were a half dozen workmen just standing by, idly watching him make the repairs. Well, the owner of this mill, after learning the facts, making sure that no injustice was being done, called that foreman to his office, handed him his pay, and promptly fired him. Well, the foreman, of course, wanted to know why. Why are you firing me? And this was the explanation that was given. I employed you to keep six men at work. I found the six idle, and you doing the work of but one. Your work could have been done just as well by any one of the six. I cannot afford to pay the wages of seven for you to teach the six how to be idle. Now, this story was actually shared by Ellen White, one of the co-founders of the Adventist Church, to illustrate the work of the pastor. This is how she introduces this story. This is in her book, Gospel Workers. She says this, In some respects, the pastor occupies a position similar to that of the foreman of a gang of laboring men or the captain of a ship's crew. They are expected to see that the men over whom they are set do the work assigned to them correctly and promptly. And only in case of emergency are they to execute in detail. She then tells the story about this mill owner who fires his foreman for teaching his men to be idle. And then she concludes by saying this, if pastors would give more attention to getting and keeping their flock actively engaged at work, they would accomplish more good, have more time for study and religious visiting, and also avoid many causes of friction. So what does this mean for us as church members? Paul here in Ephesians 4 is giving you permission. Now, he's giving you the authority to serve, to be a minister. That's empowering. You and I are able to call, to visit, to evangelize, to build up the body of Christ. And what is the result of accepting Christ's gifts, then the, the pastor equipping the members and the members becoming ministers, building up the body of Christ? Well, Paul says here in verse 13, that the result is to reach unity of faith and a knowledge of the Son of God. Here's what verse 13 says. Till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So Paul says that we are to reach unity of faith and a knowledge of the Son of God. In a world more polarized than ever, in a world where knowledge is increased yet secularism is on the rise, this is is an astounding statement. We are to reach unity of faith and a knowledge of the Son of God. Now, I know you're in the process of revising your vision and mission statements, but they basically, well, here, here's, I believe, your current ones, or are these the revision, revision ones, the one that you gave me, the vision and mission statement? Are these your current? Yeah, okay. So I know you're working on, on revising these, but these sound an awful lot like this goal that Paul says. Your vision statement to be known in Louisville metro area is the church that makes a difference transforming people and communities. In your mission statement, committed to reach out one community at a time by educating and demonstrating healthy living, practicing and preaching a spirit-filled life, and believing and teaching the prophetical narrative of the Bible. Now, this is only possible. These are great vision and mission statements, and, and I'm sure the next version is going to be even better. But this is only possible 
if every member is active in the mission. Paul says that when we do this, we will become a perfect man measured against the stature of the fullness of Christ. So who is our measure? Jesus is our measure, not other people. I know probably some of you walk into church Sabbath morning and you sit in the pew and you look to your left, you see the person sitting next to you and you kind of get a smug look on your face and think, wow, I'm glad I'm not like them. Any of you feel that way? Or maybe you walk through the doors, you sit down in the pew, you turn to the person on your right, you see them and you think, wow, that's what a real Christian looks like. If only I could be like them. And if you felt that way. But the good news is that Paul is saying here, we don't have to look at other people. Jesus is our measure. But that's also the bad news, because have you seen the measure that Christ is? In fact, the Bible says that our righteousness, or the, the, we cannot reach that measure, the measure of Christ on our own. The Bible says that all our righteousness is its filthy rags. Yet, the Bible also says that we are to be perfect, even as our Heavenly Father is perfect. Now, a better word for perfect might be the word mature. And that's exactly the direction that Paul takes us here in verse 14. He says that we should no longer be children. What's the opposite of children? A mature adult, right? So we should be mature. We should no longer be children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. So he says that we should no longer be children who are blown about by winds of doctrine and deceit. And this maturity is only made possible through Christ living through us. It's a result of this process, the Holy Spirit being given on the day of Pentecost, creating these gifts, these apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastor, teachers. And then as a result of this process of them equipping us for the work of ministry, us learning to build and edify up the church in love, then we become mature. And we're no longer tossed about by every wind of doctrine. And then verse 15, he explains what this maturity is. Verse 15, but speaking the truth in love. Speaking the truth in love. This could also mean living out the truth. And it's difficult to translate from one language to another often. How many of you speak more than one language? All right, quite a few of you. And you know that there's often phrases or words in one language that you just can't translate into the other language. It's impossible. And that's what happens here in verse 15. Speaking the truth is one word in Greek, and it's the verb form for the word truth. We don't have that in English, so we're going to make up a new word today. The new word is, we must be truthing in love. The verb form for the word truth. So that means whether we're talking or walking or living, whatever we're doing, we must be truthing in love. And Paul says that as we do that, we will grow up into all things into him who is the head, Christ, verse 16, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. So Paul concludes this section by saying that we are like Christ's body. He's the head, and we are then joined and knit together by what every joint supplies. Every part does its share. And the result is that the body grows and edifies itself in love. You are essential to this church. And some of you might feel like you walk in after the closing hymn, you sit in the back row, as soon as the, or you walk in after the opening hymn, as soon as the closing hymn begins, you slip out the back door and leave. 
And you think, I don't really matter to this church. That's not true. Just as in a body, every part is essential. There's an old proverb you're probably familiar with that goes back hundreds of years. The most popular vision is the one included in Benjamin Franklin's Poor Richard's Almanac. And this is how it goes. For the want of a nail, the shoe was lost. For the want of a shoe, the horse was lost. For the want of a horse, the rider was lost. For the want of a rider, the battle was lost. For the want of a battle, the kingdom was lost. And all for the want of a horseshoe nail. Now some of you might think you're as insignificant as a horseshoe nail. But trust me, you are essential to this church. Paul says the church is like a body. And just as a body cannot function without one of its organs, so the church cannot function without one of its members. And no one member, no matter what its title, can do all of the work. So as you think about your church's vision and mission statements, and as you work on revising them and seeing where God is leading this church, remember that it's impossible to accomplish any of that on your own. The entire church is needed to make a dent in this community, here in Middletown and in greater Louisville area. The entire church is needed. And the one who has called you has given you the power to fulfill that mission. I'm excited about how God is using you in this community and how he will continue to use you in the future. So the question I want to leave you with today, this is the last question on your worksheet, how can you build up Christ's church? What organ of the body are you? Are you a hand, an eye, an ear? Maybe you're a foot. What is your place here in this church? What do you maybe need equipped to do? I want to challenge you to spend some time, maybe this afternoon, maybe this coming week, spend some time in prayer asking God this question. What is my place in the Middletown Seventh-day Adventist Church? Then, ask Pastor Marius how you can fulfill that role. Ask him to equip you and, and help you. And then expect God to do incredible things through you. Partnering with, partnering with your church family to not only build up the body of Christ, but also to grow the church in love. How can you build up Christ's church. This time I think we'll have our closing hymn, which is I Surrender All.